do we have to be recording this? Yes, I just started yeah. the recording. Oh, OK, thank you, Melanie. All right, this meeting is now in session and is being held by electronic communications using Microsoft Teams due to the COVID-19 pandemic emergency. And over to you, Matt. Absolutely. So uh, we have a regular agenda. And the first thing we talk about is uh, items that are coming up from the board. Um, and so actions that are coming forward, you've got real property, which is working its way through right now. And I believe is adopt, uh, scheduled for consents uh, agenda on uh, March 11th. That's going uh, following that is uh, swimming pools, which will be presented for information on the 11th. Um, and uh, then there's a series of them coming up in April. Uh, the staff electronic acceptable use policy, uh, two goals policies, the Department of Teaching and Learning, uh, general instruction and an instruction of delivery options. Policies are all coming up in April. Uh, and then coming up in May, we've got some more DTL ones. So resources, uh, support resources and extended time and a selection of textbooks are all coming up in May. So we're starting to see that unsticking of that stuff that we have, all those pause policies from DTL, you're starting to start to come starting to come through. So we're beginning to unstick a few critical ones uh, and the flow is gonna is gonna go out. And as you, as you all know, we've got like 60 of them for adoption over the course of the next calendar year. So we're starting to unstick those pause policies and gonna have more of a, of a more of them coming through, including a big bubble that's gonna be set for adoption just prior to the upcoming school year in August, which you know about. Uh, so uh, there's no uh, feedback on existing policies for this week. So we're going to jump right back to uh, feedback. I mean, no, no feedback on new policies. Sorry, revised policy, right, yeah. non revised policy. Thank you very much. I should read my own agenda that's sitting right here in front of me. Uh, and we're going to shift over to feedback on the existing policies. And out of a courtesy to David, we will start with face. And in your bundle, I believe that's the third, the third one in your bundle. Uh, so it should be about three quarters of the way through because charter schools is pretty short. It's number I-11.1 family and community engagement. Any feedback on that? I didn't get anything from colleagues, and um, I read when I read through this one, it felt pretty inclusive already. Um, I think, and this was a relatively recent adoption. Um, it, is, yeah. oh, it was 2014, um, so it's not. This is not an early 2000s uh, revision. This one was already pretty up to date with things like virtual interaction um, and things like that. Um, I think we probably want to add some new language um, to wherever we land with our discipline policy, um, just making sure that these two are in concert and that any any family and community, anything that we establish there with respect to like restorative justice or like any of our major policies on that front, um, that this kind of aligns with that. Um, but I, I read through this and it felt like a solid one and there was nothing else that jumped out at me as like significantly missing. I'd actually love to hear if Daryl couldn't come up high and if there's any things that he feels that are missing. Because um, I think that you're is dealing with this particular policy on a more regular basis than, than I am necessarily. And I probably will not catch things that you will catch. Although you'll get plenty of cuts at this when you're actually revising it. But would love to hear you voice over them if you can. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't had a chance to review the policy, so once I take a look at it, I'll definitely um, keep my eyes and make sure, you know, the most recent um, best practices in regards to how we're doing family and community engagement, making sure that those are included in the policy. Uh I did not uh, have any um, anything that jumped out at me, although um, as Christina said, I'm glad uh, Daryl's here because I would like to hear from, you know, the policy expert on this. I, I did speak to um, uh, Aaron Gregory about it, um, as well as Isabel, the PACE coordinator. Um, and, and they said uh, that the most of the issues they have concern are in the PIP, which gets to some specific details about practices, which are outdated, right? So there's some things in here that we're doing now that aren't listed. There's some things that we've changed some labels, that sort of stuff. So um, like you, the policy in general, they felt was a, the policy itself is, is pretty good. It's the details that are in the PIP 
um, that are, are sort of um, a little outdated. And that's an interesting question about how detailed you get your PIP, right? This is one of the more detailed PIPs. Yeah. And we may, find it, we may find this PIP is just a little bit too detailed, right? Because then it becomes out of date too soon. And, and at some level, we want to be one level, perhaps one layer down. So it'll be really interesting to see if they put, strip some of the details out of the PIP uh, and move those into other sorts of governance documents um, so that the PIP can remain relevant uh, over longer periods of time. So we'll see what they say about that. I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. The other thing is that this... It, it, when I read that, when I read this policy, it feels like family and community engagement writ large. That it's uh -huh. talking about the overall strategy about how we engage with families and community members, yeah. as opposed to being very narrow to the face coordinator role. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to decide what level of grain size is uh -huh. this policy designed to address. Is this policy designed to address the big umbrella, non-capitalized family and community engagement? Or is it the very, very small face coordinator in all caps, which is an acronym? Like that, I think, is what we need to narrow down here. Um, and I think I think the answer to that is it's the broad. It's not the narrow, because we normally don't have a policy that governs an individual job description. Right. Uh, but clarifying that and clarifying mm -hmm. if we're going to continue with, assuming that we're going to continue with a face coordinator, as an individual job description in service of family and community engagement, figuring out where that particular role fits within here. Yeah. Okay, thank you, that was good. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree with that. I think it, it is or needs to be aimed at the broader rather yeah. than the narrow. And um, I guess this PIP um, kind of does both. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the event that we lose a family and community engagement coordinator or add an additional one or something, you know, this PIP seems a little too detailed, yeah. Um, yeah. although it's a PIP and not a policy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so I, I don't know if this is something yeah. you guys are going to have to. Structurally, you can break it into two. You could have a PIP, which is... Yeah general practices for staff and then a second one tied to the face coordinator sort of thing so there's, there's structural ways of handling that too brian yeah well, well one thing i'm in the embryonic stage of looking at community engagement as, as far as how families reach us um it's a i presented like a, a, a scratch up draft to the superintendent about two weeks ago and you know just imagine if you if you if, if you will with me for a second everyone it's basically, you know, it's something we would put on the website. If you're a parent, if you have a school issue, it kind of gives like a tree of who you contact, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it may, may be principal first, this person. Then there's a second line, I would say a defense, but a second line of people that you can contact to, that you, uh, if you don't get a response. And that last column would be something like, you know, the board, superintendent's office, and so forth. And so, and that was really my brainchild because of how many people reach our office. And also, you know, I'm, connected with the, the board office as well on things. And I think a lot of these things could be resolved, you know, if people had a, you know, kind of like, um, like you say, read like a process decision map uh, for when they go to the engage page. So we're the embryonic stages of that. I showed them a scratch draft so far. So I'm just letting you know that that's something that's being worked on that. So would that, how would that affect this PIP? Well, it would affect by, I just, my notes say to put you on the revision team, Brian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how's that? How's, how's that? You know, I, I, because I'm hearing you, Daryl had some ideas and you have some ideas. So mm -hmm. I, I think we want to codify those things in PIPs. And so my my usual logic, Brian, is to look at the body of knowledge that we want to put out there and then sure. see where it naturally falls into the PIPs, right? And you don't try to pre-structure them. You just sort of think that through and then say, this is this and this is this. I'm a big fan of shorter yeah. topic-related policies and PIPs. Yeah. Punk, punk, punk. Uh, a lot of people don't like that, but I think that allows you to be more specific and more granular and more precise in your work. It makes it easier for people to find stuff too. You know, sure. you got really long, big, bulky documents. You can look through 35 pages to find something. Got nobody, it. Can, nobody can find it. So I think it makes sense, Brian. But so if I, I put some notes in there, they'll go back to uh, the, the revision team to, to get your thoughts on that. And we'll see what it all plays out. All right, perfect. Thank you. And I love I love that as a concept, even just to have on the website of I have a problem, click here and it'll take you straight to Absolutely. where you need to go. I think that'll be great. The yeah. in the policy here, the responsibilities section, I think mm -hmm. that's where 
even if the graph is not in here, but I think that that's where you would outline huh. for this kind of issue, go da 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 da. Yeah. For that kind of issue, go da 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 da, whatever it looks like. I think that's exactly where that would fit okay. a, in like a narrative version, not in a graphic version. Got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love this idea. This would be because ninety percent of questions. Reed Reed's been doing this for far longer than I have, but ninety percent of questions that I get is, I have a problem. Where do I go next? Absolutely. If, if, like that just got mitigated, and if it was like flagging issue, where do I go? Um, and we could just tell people, here's the here's the decision tree process. If you got an answer that is like, if the answer is not meeting your expectations or whatever, here's how you escalate it. Absolutely. But start here. Start here, absolutely. Yeah. If if you want to see it in action, um, there's nothing new under the sun. Alexandria County has it already. And so, of course huh? they do. Yeah. <laughs> you were like Alexandria's. I'm just stealing that one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's nothing new under the sun, and so we should be doing it here. So yeah, if they figured it out, then we should just do that. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right, that's what I've captured. That and that's that's a great idea. We're getting to knowledge management, which is one of my favorite topics here. How to, if only we knew what we knew. If only we knew what we didn't know. That'd be great. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other feedback on this policy? No. Okay. No. No. All right. So, Daryl, that's it. We're going to shift to another one. Uh, we're going to shift right. to uh, the ever engaging financial and management gifts gifts to employees. I'm All sure right. your favorite topic. Well, hello, everyone. Good meeting, everyone. Have oh, a great afternoon. Great to meet you, Daryl. Coming. All righty. Uh, oh, I got this in the wrong order tonight. Sorry about that. Uh, and I'm realizing I assembled the bundle in, out of order with what I had on the agenda. Fine. Sorry about that. They right. it out. It's all good. No worries. It's <laughs> okay. the top of your document. Yeah. Uh, so the, the bundle's in the right order, but the agenda is not. Oh, anyway. In the alphabetical order. All right. Gifts to employees, G2.9. Very short policy, a little longer pip. So the only problem that I have with the, this one is that if I, I if I were a betting person, I would bet that this one's in violation pretty frequently because of the low bar of what a gift is totaled. And so given the knowledge that I have of like you have the big back to school gift card and then you have the like end holiday gift card and then you have the spring break gift card and you have the end of the year gift card and then you have teacher's day gift card and if you add those up together if a family does a twenty dollar gift card for all of them that's more than 100 bucks so i don't know how we mitigate that because i know that i know for a fact that that happens so uh we if, if the best practice and if recommended policy is to keep it at 100 cool we just have to acknowledge that this one probably gets violated pretty regularly and is not one that we're necessarily going to enforce with rigor unless it becomes a massive problem. Um, because again, it's like the accumulation of like the, the five, ten, twenty dollar gift cards that can then can definitely amount to over a hundred bucks for an individual teacher over the course of a year. Does it say over a year in the PIP? That's what I'm trying to read. That's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah, during yeah. a school year. During a school year from during anyone, year. student, individual, yeah. family, or organization. Yeah. Okay. So I've, I've noted that the this, this is a little low, and I think I think you're right. That it can very easily add up to more than 100 bucks over the course of a school year. And I don't know what best practices like. If if 100 dollars is best practice, like I know that. Um, I mean, when I worked in the Senate, it was 25 dollars per instance. Um, and so if that is a best practice and saying like no, uh, gifts of no more than $25 per individual gift might be a better way of dealing with it. Um, whatever the best practice is here, happy to defer to that. Just that one struck me as that's a low dollar amount for okay. the generosity of our community. Well, the generosity of some of our community, Correct. the part of the community that can afford it and the part i don't know how to fit this in but the part of this that bothers me is you know this goes on more rampantly the farther north you go and less the farther south you go so um you know as christina said uh, we know this goes on and the gift cards and the outright cash gifts at you know christmas time end of the year etc cetera, etc cetera, likely adds up to more than a hundred 
um, dollars per employee. Um, nothing like that occurs in Title I schools. Yeah. So I'm worried that it has an impact on uh, recruitment and, you know, also teacher transfers. Um, now, I don't know what it's like in Congress, but I know in the federal government, you know, they send out these ethics reminders, you know, coming up on the Christmas season every year about, you know, accepting gifts, going to parties and accepting, you know, whatever is being poured and, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't really know how much, how many resources they spend actually policing, um, you know, federal employees, you know, to, to keep them on the straight and narrow. But, you know, they're certainly sending a lot of reminders that, you know, this is outside the ethics, you know, these are ethics violations, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure what I'm recommending here, but there is certainly an equitable situation, an un unequal situation. Um, going on here. All right. So, so um, I, I kind of sort of capture that in my notes read here is that the issue is the fact that teachers at some schools get more gifts than teachers at other schools, an issue related to this policy. So I just want to be sure that they're aware of that because I think that's what you're, I think that captures the essence and what, what, if anything, are we going to do about that? Um, yeah. What, if anything, are we going to do about that? Yeah. Okay, so to, a certain, to a certain extent, the low cap helps to limit that. Right, the lower cap at least limits that. Yeah, uh, because you know you get a thousand bucks, then there's a big, huge oh. spread, right? But yeah, the lower cap helps to limit that a little bit. It does, although uh, I mean, uh, it, it, if, it if anybody's paying attention to it, yeah, yeah. I, I do think they try to pay attention to it. I really, I, I, mm -hmm. in fact, I know that they do. So, well, but, you know, when the call goes out from the room parent to the, the rest of the parents, you know, in that room for, you know, uh, Ms. Mrs. Smith's, you know, third grade class. And each one of the students' parents responds with something. Um, trying to do the math in my head. So if they respond with more than $4 each, then, you know, you're over the you're over the 25 uh, you're over the hundred dollars it says that it's from any one student individual family or organization yeah yeah so well, at that point if the family gives four dollars here four dollars here four dollars here and it does not total a hundred dollars in total yeah. then that's technically within compliance right. it's if as a family i give a 20 dollar gift card at the beginning of the year and then another one at like the end of the quarter and then another one at uh, the holiday time, and then another one at spring break. I'm already at a hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean, I think per, I need one more. Yeah. Per employee. Per employee, per yeah. family, yeah. student individual family per school year. Yeah. yeah. So when the when the the call goes out from the room parent, and every family ponies up a hundred bucks, then that teacher is looking at you know twenty four, twenty five hundred bucks, and uh, that is a significant yeah, um, something. A lot. I'm not saying everybody does that, but I, I hear from some schools that that practice does go on. And I know from the, you know, the affluence of those neighborhoods that um, there can be a significant response. Yeah, I agree. Uh, agree. So I think I think figuring out what best practices here are and then deferring to those and seeing if there's what are other districts have done to mitigate this problem, I think will be really, really helpful. Um, whether it's like restructuring it, keeping it as like a total per year or restructuring it to be a no more than this much in each amount, not to exceed so much per year, whatever that combination looks like, I think that's going to help address this yeah and well, maybe a know, specific mention of like the, the case that reed is talking about like when a room parent calls for contributions across the entire the entire classroom not to exceed so much per family something like that um yeah i don't know what to do here i mean i i would have less heartburn if the whole thing were couched in terms of homemade 
some things, you know, brownies or, you know, popsicle sticks glued together in some, you know, unique sculpture or, you know, something. Um, I mean, I think taking a step back, the whole policy does allow gifts. Um, I think that's something we maybe want to look at. Uh, and it also kind of moving on to a, a separate nuance here. It allows retirement gifts also, if I'm reading this right, from the organization to the retiring employee. Yes, yeah, so I think that was, I think, I believe that was in the PIP as well. Yeah, I think so. And I, I'm, I'm yeah, unclear because we had this issue a couple of years ago about providing gifts for some of these ceremonial things like the honored citizens um, awards. And it was unclear what, what we were actually able to do. You know, set aside what's ultimately public money for gifts for private citizens. You know, it's not a retirement thing. Um, so I think that's something that problem with this year. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Christina. No, just something to consider. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. All right. So here we Before we move on, I can clarify that the guidance we got from John Caffrey was that if you are giving like honored citizens, it is considered an award and not a gift. And it's OK to spend public funds on awards. So that's that's what we've based our practice on for honored citizens anyway. OK. OK. And, and hey, Melanie, did I remember that that we had asked John, but um, was there any mention or thought of a dollar limit on those awards? I don't remember that being part of the conversation. No. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, so so yeah, so there's a provision in here. It says awards not from an organization not affiliated with Arlington Public Schools, right? So is that what you're referring to? No, those, this those is a, this is a this is in the case of Arlington Public Schools providing an award to someone who is not an Arlington Public Schools employee. Oh, I understanding that right, Reed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. correct. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So is that in scope or out of scope in this thing? Right. Because this 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 doesn't right. talk about that at all. Right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on that one? All righty. Moving on to Gina three dot nine staffing requirements. So, Reed, if you want to go first on this one, I have a lot of thoughts on this one. Oh, okay. All right. Then, um, uh, let me pull it up here. Um, sorry, it's here somewhere. It's uh, G3.9. Correct. G3.9. Um, okay, this is a bit. It starts on page four of the bundle that was sent around, or the bundle was posted on the website. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, Oh, yeah, I had a question on this one. OK, it's on line 20 on that first page. Uh -huh. It's on paragraph B1. Okay. It says the community must be involved in the decision making process at the school. So the way I read this, um, this was, you know, something that's been a, a topic of debate for a while mm -hmm. where the principal you know, it takes a point two here and a point two there and a you know point five here and combines them into a full time you know a single FTE to be able to respond to something. 
uh, that wasn't anticipated when the budget was, um, you know, first compiled and approved. That's um, you know, and a lot of times it happens with the specials. Um, you know, you got an art class, it's being offered in high school, it's being offered three days a week. Well, you know, you cut out one of them and, you know, now you've got to point something and you can, you know, hobble that together with something else and that kind of thing. But really, we're supposed to involve the community in that because I don't think that happens. I'm not sure it needs to happen. Okay. So my whole feedback on this is that this outlines a process whereby the board is supposed to be notified by that, but I've never actually seen us track this well. No. And it's been a point of contention and a question, particularly from the AEA, about whether or not this, they've raised a lot of questions in the past about whether or not principals are doing, are following this PIP, are they actually providing the notice and then at a, regardless of the actual implementation of it and whether or not it's working, taking it to a broader level, if we don't know how principals are reallocating their staff to meet the needs of their schools, then we can't make the choice to change the planning factor accordingly. And the fact that we haven't actually been tracking this for years has made it really, really difficult to see I mean, from the outs, from the the BAC, the BAC's perspective for years, it always felt like we were giving this bucket of money to principals, and then they were doing like a lot of a lot of staff members just stayed their full FTE, and that was fine. But then they were playing these creative, like, I don't know, they were playing Jenga essentially or Tetris with different components of of partial FTEs until they could fill in a role, and then it was never clear whether or not that person was actually doing. If there are three different job descriptions, are they actually doing all three different job descriptions? Or are they doing something totally different? And the lack of tracking there has just made it really hard for us to then go back and talk about the planning factor. And if we're finding that in reality, in order to do the job well we need to combine this particular FTE and that FTE, we need to know that. And we need to change the planning factor to do that systematically. And I just, as we're going through revising this PIP, we need to make sure that whatever we put in the PIP is something that we can actually track and that we're gonna be able to do and like actually see where we're going with it. And then decide, there's gonna be some decisions here about what is the process for principals to approve that, because it says that they're supposed to be reported annually to this approval for such conversions must be reported annually from the superintendent. Never seen that before. Don't know if it exists. Um, and that means that we need to be tracking it somewhere. Never seen that before. Don't know that it exists. So, go ahead, Brian. I know that you see that you have. Let me jump there. in here because no, on the operation side, yeah. I heard of this practice, and of course, I was appalled, right? Um, and, and I'm like seeing some schools that have more, they're, they're combining these points, sixes and threes all over the place. And then at the same time, they come, I go to a budget meeting, Reed seen me after a budget meeting before, and they say, I don't have enough. And so I'm like, something's going on here. So covertly, um, your guy in your board office, I've had him to start to, he was, this was something he was doing, taking a look at, put it in the spreadsheet here. So there is some kind of tracking. I can send to have it sent to you. All right. So there was a process that was actually, uh, I guess, an investigation, right, or taking a look at it. And so John Mickelweiss was taking a look into it. And okay. so, of course, I talked to Mr. Fobe from the AEA. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I was even more appalled after talking to him for, because I'm like, what? And so right now I have him and kind of uh, Mr. Mickelweiss, I know he works for you guys, uh, kind of taking, a, actually giving him access to new numbers. Um, because again, what was happening was, uh, we had our HR department like, hey, they weren't providing the information to him. So I've begun that blocking and tackling. So I did that like about maybe about a month ago at this point, haven't they been able to check with Mr. Mikovice? So there's a reporting. And so we've been kind of acting quietly, taking a look at this until I can fully understand the whole situation. Because you have some schools who don't have enough, but they're, they're doing a great job. You know, but then you have others that are like have so many of these positions and say we still need more people. So um, let me get with my little crack team 
Um, and so we can provide some kind of reporting um, on, on this. And it's just one of the many things that I found absurd when I first came here, but just haven't had a chance yeah. to provide the laser focus on. So just to kind of give you an update that something's out there, but I don't think whoever was here before wanted anybody to really see this. Um, no, certainly not. Okay. So, so, so from, technical, I, from a technical perspective, Brian, just so you all know to this, they're also working at looking at technical limitations. Mm -hmm. about how you can keep that from happening. It's called position control. Yep. So you can only, only fill positions that are open in the budget. Yeah. Right. And so that's tying back together the hiring practices with the positions in the budget at a technical level within the IT, within the actual systems, within the star system itself. Okay. So that becomes your enforcement tool okay. around okay. it. Right. So so then if you if you do that, then they want to combine the things. OK, but then they have to go into stars and actually configure it to let you do that work. Right. So now you've got solid records about all the changes that have happened. And right? then we so, see it over time and we're going to see what's happening. I think that's going to be great. Right. Right. Yeah. Your point, your point about the need to adjust to planning factors. Right. The board needs the data so that you can adjust planning factors. Say, Absolutely. Well, this is the wrong planning factor because everybody's tweaking it. It's the wrong planning factor. Clearly it's not working. So let's find something better. No, I just right. 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 Moving back out to the policy, though, um, since we just had this conversation and there's clearly a lot of work that's happening, um, does it, is this a moment where we might want to actually pause this one a little bit longer until we can do more of the analysis and get some substantive data and get the right process before we document a process that we don't want to keep permanently? I know that we have a six month lead up, but like is six months enough time for us to do this investigation, make some decisions about it, and design a new process. My first, is, my first thought is the investigation has already started. I need to check up on it. Um, and I would like to get a status of where we are with it at this particular point, but it's something that needs to be addressed. I would say, and forgive me, maybe naivete, but I definitely, based on what I find out from Mr. McAvice, um, I could give you a better forecast of how long it would take, but to me, six months sounds like enough time. But okay. it, but then again, I'm passionate about when I see things wrong, um, and I may be kind of pushing the timetable a little bit because I want to get it resolved. So, but let me check right. with Mr. Mikovice on that one. In Let's reality, you, you haven't got six months. Six months until adoption. Remember, the last three months of that are feedback. Yeah. So you've really only got like a month. <laughs> okay. A month. To, a month to begin. Uh, but, but, right, but, right. Just, just saying. So, so there's feedback. At this, there's a feedback and adoption processes are about three of those six months, right? Okay. So, but, but, but we may have enough information so far in the investigation to make a determination on what needs to happen. And we, yes, exactly, exactly. We, 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 we absolutely might, Brian. And I know that this has been a conversation that HR and finance have been talking about a lot. So there, everybody's hot to try to to address this issue. I think there's no question. But there's a lot of everybody's everybody's ready to address it. So uh, we all but Christine, uh, to your point, Christina, the policy, the PIP need to support the process. If you're not quite ready to implement the process yet, then you need to hold off on the policy and the PIP until it can back whatever the process is going to be. Whatever the new process will be. Whatever the new process is. Exactly. And so it may be a, a very close from a timing perspective. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure this, this may need to be, to have a place in the, um, policy, you know, or PIP, I don't know, maybe policy, but my understanding of, you know, class size, mm -hmm. the class size, um, mandate per budget action. Uh, is that class size is an average taken across the entire system. So there may be uh, classes, you know, with very few students in them, and they are averaged in, you know, you know, some some esoteric, you know, high school math class you know, offered to only a few students at the, I don't know, 11th grade level or something like that. Uh, and 11th grade um, class size is calculated 
on all of the 11th grade classes, including the one with, you know, the four students in it. Um, I don't know if that's really true, n nor have I ever found, you know, a description of where, um, of how this class size is actually, you know, calculated or manifested. Are, are they still issuing the stoplight class size report? Yeah, that's a great question, because the last still, I saw was two years ago. Okay, because I, I helped color code that one, so yeah. I could describe what it used to be. Yeah. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. what they would do was, be, Christine, what this was, was it was looking at every single class for the school system broken down by various categories. Who's like hot, grades. who's not, like who's... It, who's was, it, was a, it was a grid, so grades and courses and that sort of stuff. And then it had the average class size, but then it had a stoplight section. So the number of classes that were over mm -hmm. that versus under and that sort of stuff. And, and so, so it helped give you a visual sense of all that. There's actually also caps. So class cannot exceed X size, right? So, so there's a maximum class size, and if it exceeds that size, then then you've got to create a new you've got to create a new class. So there are caps of classes, right? So there's a maximum size of any given class. Some of it's in here, like the kindergarten class, right? Uh, so so there's some, there's some well, actually it's not you know, specific, but there's those caps, and then the planning factors are more of the average, right? So you want to think about the planning factor as sort of your average class size. You get one teacher for every 23 kids. That's saying that's the average class size, right? But you're right. If I've got a math class with eight kids, then I've got to have another class, a bunch of other classes at 30 kids to compensate for that planning factor so the math all works out correctly. Which has fascinating budget implications yes. because you look at your cost per pupil for those tiny classes and it's high. you look yeah. at your ROI there uh, and that's a really fascinating way to look at the budget. Not that it's anything to do with this meeting right now, but that yeah. is a, <laughs> it's and, a personal and, passion of mine. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, fascinating and challenging operational uh, issues. Yeah. Because, you know, when if you're a school that's very popular and you're adding and adding and adding kids every year, and we haven't gotten around to changing the boundaries, you know, to more level or right size the enrollment, and that extra kid shows up, you're like, okay, so now I'm going to start a whole new class because this kid showed up. So um, there's no more room in my building because, right. you know, I'm over capacity anyway. So I need another trailer, you know, facilities and operations. Yeah, I got one more kid. So bring a trailer over. Oh, let's see. My lot is full. Where do you put it? Uh, so this sounds good on paper, but um, I, I don't know that it actually, you know, can work out. Um, that was one thing I wanted to say. The other thing that maybe you want to think about, Matt, in doing this is um, a lot of times the um, principals do this. You know, they cobble together the 0.2 and the 0.5 and the blah, blah, blah to be able to respond to mid-year, you know, hair on fire, you know, yep. uh, urgencies. Sure. Uh, many times coming from the school board. Oh, I thought up a great idea and the schools ought to do this and do that and offer this and respond with that. And so, you know, there might be needs to be something in the policy, you know, that says the superintendent recommends or the school board members will not will keep it in mind that, you know, mid-year initiatives are out of sync with, you know, budget and operational, you know something um okay. thank you for the acknowledgement <laughs> yeah yeah because you know the board says to the superintendent uh you know here's a here's a great initiative and the superintendent says it to the principals all right board wants to do this and you know it's right. mid-year and and the principals know that this stuff happens so that they have this right. i use this term you know liberally slush fund of mm -hmm you know, point threes and point nines and stuff like that to be able to respond to, you know, what the boss wants instead of having to say to him, right. uh, yeah, uh, sure, we'll start that in September, you know, with the new staffing allocation. Right. And the board has a tool to take care of that, the budget, right? Yeah. So you, you, you have a tool at your disposal to do anything you want to. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. And so, really, that's what the superintendent needs to say when, you know, board member comes up with something like that is, OK, put it in the budget and, you know, we'll make it happen. 
<laughs> to be fair, we had a in previous iteration of the board before either you and I were much more likely to be like, hey, pet project, throw it in mid-year. Um, we have gotten away from that. So to be fair, it's slightly less of a problem, but it's still not yeah. a problem. Yeah. But, but, so, but now, is the, now is a great opportunity to codify that in policy. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Codified new policy. initiatives, like, unless in case of an emergency, like example, pandemic, new initiatives start with the beginning of the school year and are, mm -hmm. are, are taken in context of the budget, something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, I mean, you know, board members can be guilty of this and, you know, sometimes are, but there are also other things like the, the whole SRO activity, sure. you know, came up as a result of the tragic events that occurred in um, Minneapolis in June after our, or May and June after our budget was already established for this coming year. But whoops, there's a, you know, there's a new initiative, a new interest mm -hmm. that has to happen. Um, so, you know, things come up and everybody knows that. And, you know, I'm sure in the superintendent's, whatever it's called, operating fund or something, there's extra money there for unknown unknowns that are mm -hmm. going to come up in the school year. That's what contingency funds are for, right? That's yeah. why we have that's that yeah. that's why we have contingency funds. Yeah. <laughs> in theory, yeah. for those things that you don't plan on, right? Those true yeah. emergencies. Yeah. A tragedy occurs and that and we need to respond to that. Like COVID. You know, yeah. Right? Totally. You know, whatever those that anyway. Yeah. Don't don't get me started on these topics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we could be here I'll, all day. I'll go all day. <laughs> okay. I think oh. <laughs> OK, uh, sorry, um, I waxed a little too uh, too much on that. Um, th th that's all I have to say about this one. Is there more? OK, so these are really great points. Around that. And this is really I think this is a really critical policy right now, given the budget conversations, everything else. So I'm yeah. hearing let's get this policy right. Yep. Right. This is not just let's look at this really carefully. Be sure it's factoring all these things in. This is going to set the direction. For the future, because 80% of our budget is staff, yeah. and and this is the policy that drives a lot of that. Let's 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 get this one right. Perfect. All right, and I'll do my. I'm, I'm gonna get it. Uh, check it to my investigation, and I'll uh, follow back up with you guys. Okay. See what um, the one one just asterisk to the end of that. I just realized that this is also a policy that might end up getting changed in a version of the world where we are pursuing collective bargaining. So let's get it right this time so that we have a very solid foundation when we go into a collective bargaining engagement so that we know that if we're modifying it, we're building off of a really solid foundation instead of a wobbly foundation. But just making sure that we're remembering that this is this is one of those policies that will likely get some modifications depending on where we land. Got it. Perfect. Right. Perfect. You all, I'm to join the superintendent at three o'clock. I'm one minute late. <laughs> By all means. All right, great thing. I the first couple of times Christina last year, some one time I just got up and left because I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I'll apologize later. All right. All right. Matt, I'll talk to you later on this afternoon. All right, Brian. Take care. All right. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. I think this right. last one's gonna be really simple though, anyways. Hmm? <laughs> this last one should be really simple if it's basically taken directly from code. Yeah, as far as I know, the charter schools one is strictly, I haven't looked it over in details, but I'm assuming, uh, I've, I've glanced over it, and I know a little bit about the code, but this is just code language, and it just sort of, this is what we are required to do and say, and that's what it is. So I'm assuming this one is just review the code of Virginia and ensure we are in compliance with it. Yep. That's that's really all that's really all there is to that. It's not the board is not attempting to encourage the creation of charter schools or or sanction that or or push it forward or anything else. It's we will do what the code says. Right. Whatever is legally required in the code. Sounds good. That should be it. OK. This uh, this is a policy that is actually a board policy. Mm. So this is one of those, we came up with a little list of policies. There were several of them. We said, you know, this falls under board purview mm -hmm. rather than, you know, departments. 
right? So this is one of those ones that fall under that. And we, we have actually don't have a process for that. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to think about the shepherding process for those. We mentioned a couple of them a couple of weeks ago. Recall that. So we just I think that we just need to put our heads together. The three of us probably come up with a procedure that's gonna work around how to, and how just how those go through. Like historically, last year when the board did this policies, they didn't go through all the steps. They didn't do the public comment. The board policies didn't go off for public comment. All the rest of the policies did, but the board policies didn't. So that was sort of interesting. So I'd encourage you to follow the same process everybody else does. <laughs> I think that would be better. Um, and I think we should get like feedback from the community. We're always going to default to more feedback. Um, yeah, Matt, did I forget an action item to schedule some time with you to go through the ones we talked about a couple weeks ago? Uh, if that was your action item, um, then yes, you did. <laughs> if that was my action I'm item, sorry. I did. That might, been, that, that, that might have been on me. Uh, I'm we can not find about it. Yeah, we can find some time. And if we want to rope this one in, because yep. this is literally just going to be look at the code of Virginia. Yep. Copy paste. Yeah. I have on our schedule, I have a list of all the policies that we think are board policies. Okay. Whichever those are. So we will just talk about all of those. A lot of those are like the advisory committee ones. This one, there's 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 just there's there's a few more like that. But we'll just we'll we'll treat them all as a big as a group and we'll sort of make a decision about how we want to proceed with those. Okay. That sounds good. Um, Reed, do you want to be in part of, in the conversation about talking about the process of how we're going to triage these or? Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, we'll find time for the three of us to huddle and talk about the process. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the PRT has a, we have a standard process. You can just to change that. You can just, you can follow our standard process. The the only complexity is that um, we always have what's called a shepherd, so a person who is moving the policy through the process, right? And that's what the PRT members do. So who's going to do that? I mean, that could be a, I can shepherd them through if if you want, which is said this is next, this is next, this is next, or somebody else can. It's not a very complicated process, and it's where it's very very well documented. So uh, you form a committee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and away you go. So, I think you're probably the best person to shepherd them. Just yeah, speaking for myself, uh, because even if there's a policy, it's likely that in all of the other craziness that's going to happen, that we're going to lose it. In terms of actually drafting them, I'm happy to contribute on that front. Um, but I think that in making sure that the next the steps are followed, you're already doing that with the other ones too. So I think that that's helpful. Right, right. And, and what I do is I I coach everybody else on the process. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I coach everybody so I can do it personally or Melanie's going to kill me, but we could um, show somebody in the board office how to do it, too. Somebody else in the board office how to do it, too. Uh, it's not a horribly time consuming process. Um, okay. So but but I, I'm happy you know, I can do it. Um, it, it. It's not hard for me to do it all. Um, and it's well laid out. So. What do you think, Reed? Um, OK, all right. So I'll, I'll just I'll sort of do it from a, as long as there's not having to write the content, you know, yeah. if I get into writing content, that's a, that's, a, that's a whole other time commitment. Again, I like writing policy, so I'm not it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, but, but it could get time consuming. No, and I'm happy to do the writing if okay. you could do the shepherding. Absolutely. Those Absolutely. are not actual words, but yes, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, author, it's authoring and process process person. Step, pro, pro, Almost like a project manager, right? <laughs> step yeah. one, step two, right. step tasks, timelines, that sort of stuff, right? We do it all very much mapped out. Um, we actually have a, uh, we're experimenting with a tool uh, in Microsoft uh, 365 environment called Planner, and it actually maps Ooh. out all of the steps. And I actually have templates built. So step one, you do this with all the descriptions and all the subtasks. So we can we can fiddle with that because then it's really obvious. Got to do this, and we got to do this, and we got to do this. So uh, it's like a project. It's a project management software. It yeah. is. It's it, it's it's a very light version of project, and so yeah. we simply built um, right, and then we built templates around that. So the six stages that the process that the policy goes through, uh, and then all of the subtasks. And then we have templates. You just copy it, change the policy name, assign it to somebody. Oh, you you here's your checklist. Boom 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 no, boom boom. boom. Things. Here's yeah. your checklist. Here's how the timelines work. Here's here's what you put the data so we can track everything, gets on the, all the agendas and all the rest of that sort of stuff. So it's all real straightforward. Helpful. I love it. It's, yeah. 
I am APS process man for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I am the process guy. Yeah, okay. Love it. All right. I, I think that's it. Okay. I don't so, have anything else for the good cause. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So, so good. Christina, you, we'll, we'll reach out and we'll have a we'll have a little. We'll touch we'll, base on what on the drafting that needs to happen. Um, okay. And I can spend some time drafting it. Um, ballpark timeline. What do we think we're going to need based on those those other policies? Are we going to need it like by the end of next week, or do we have a couple of weeks on it? I'd have to go back and look at the dates. Um, I don't I don't really remember. Typically, the way that it works is uh, there's about uh, a month to a month and a half after we get the initial feedback. Uh, before we're supposed to have a draft. Okay. Um, a draft that comes back to the PRT, the ELT, and then back to the subcommittee, right? So so that initial feedback takes a couple of weeks. Um, but in practice, you know, it, it doesn't kill us to have to push back. The, oh, if we don't hit those, all that matters is that the, the, the adoption date gets pushed back. I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not devastating. We're not, talking about things, things. we're not talking about a real emergency here. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, right, so, so we can make adjustments there once we get our, 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 our feet on the ground. Um, is it's about six months, but you can do it in four, depending on, on your sense of urgency around them. So, yeah, I'm just thinking this this week for for, for me is just a very complicated week between work and um, school board meetings in the evenings. So there's no way I'd be able to look at it this week. But if we can do like towards the end of next week or the week after, I can actually sit down and think about it and process it in an intentional okay. Yeah. That's a, that, that sounds good. So what I'll do is I'll do my homework. I'll get all of the board policies, understand what those are yeah. so that we can talk about that as a collective group, even yeah. if they're following different schedules. We understand that we get the drills and routines down. So it just sort of flows, flows correctly. We may make some adjustments to some dates based on what your schedule looks like. Exactly. Um, I think that'll yeah. be great. And we'll, we'll schedule some time. Um, okay. What does later this uh, actually, what does early next week look like? That might be the best uh, doing this. Yeah, let me look at my calendar here. Uh, so the week of the 14th. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's actually looking pretty good. Um, it's looking pretty good. I, mean, I have meetings. I have meetings scattered throughout the time, but I'm not I'm not being oh, rushed. Tuesday anybody. morning. Tuesday morning is good. I have my first meetings at one o'clock in the afternoon. OK, can we do a 10 to 11? Yep. Great. You want to send me the invite or want me to send it to you? Uh, if you could send that to me, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Microsoft Teams meeting. You said 10 to 11? Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. There Perfect. you go. Board policy is 10 to 11, Tuesday the 16th. Great. We actually completed our action item. Go us. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like nothing, nothing like that. That's <laughs> why, why they pay us the big bucks. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Okay. I had a mentor once tell me one time, Matt, if you can do it in five minutes, do it right away. Do it. Just do it now. Just, just do, it, do now. it now. Don't wait. Just, if you can do it in five minutes, if it's more than five minutes, go ahead and put it off. Five minutes, do it immediately. Just do it now. Man, one of the best rules I've ever got. Do it. <laughs> because then you don't accumulate all the five minute tasks that just. That's right. Exhausting. That's right. You're accumulating hour tasks and then you block off hours to work on those. Exactly. Well, I mean, my attitude is I got to do it right away anyway, no matter how long it takes. Because if I wait, then, you know, it gets pushed so far down, you know, my inbox or my to-do list by, you know, everything else that gets piled up. Yep. Uh, you know, and I say to myself, oh, yeah, well, I'll come back to that. You know, I'll see it there on the top of the email screen. And yeah, well, that's gone after, you know. After five minutes and all of a sudden it's pushed yeah. down. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah, e e email is not a good task management no, I mean, APS uses it like crazy. No, you know, I'm, I'm using uh, to do Microsoft to do planner and to do for it. And I, and I, I like that. It's working pretty well for me. So we work, to, we use teamwork at work and it's amazing. I love yeah. the notification settings because I can send myself if there's a task that I have not consciously remembered, I can send myself reminders. It's excellent. Yep. Yeah. yeah. 
there's all sorts of ways of making this sort of stuff work. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> big fans of that. All right. So is that it? Are we set? Yeah, I think so. I guess so. Reed, yeah. you need to formally end the meeting. Oh, oh. Uh, how do I do that? You say you this just... meeting is adjourned. Oh, I just, okay. We're all set, right? Yep. Okay. All right. Then this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Honestly, we are adjourned. All Bye, right. Everybody. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Melanie.